This is Colin Cattell with Palisade Radio. On the line with us today is Hong Kong-based fund manager Tiho Burkan, also the publisher of shortsightoflong.com. Tiho, thanks for joining us. Uh, my absolute pleasure. Tiho, let's jump into the precious metals. You've mentioned that further downside could be in store for gold and silver. Today was obviously a big breakout day for gold and silver. Several industry experts have held to their previous opinions that the bottom for gold was indeed made at 1180 last year. What's your feeling at this point in time? Well, as you probably know, over the recent uh, couple of months, um, especially around middle of April as gold peaked once again at $1,400. We've had uh, a steady slow decline, but at the same time, if we look at the Commitment of Traders report, uh, which is available to everybody out there, we had a huge buildup of shorts, especially in the silver market. So what I think my current view is that we're really having a short squeeze on all of these bets. Um, Whether this um, pushes prices even higher from this point onwards, uh, remains to be seen, but um, I'm of opinion that uh, I'm not 100% certain yet that we're at the bottom. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I've been buying silver uh, the whole way down uh, because I'm a huge precious metals optimist in the long term. But um, uh, even though gold miners have corrected uh, quite strongly over the last three years, they've been beaten down, and especially the explorers and the juniors as well. Some of the stocks are down 90%. Uh, from their 2011 highs, uh, gold has only corrected about 30 to 35 percent, and um, I'm not quite convinced yet that gold's bottom. But um, you know, days like today uh, sort of uh, make you think that uh, there's a possibility that we could be starting a new uptrend. But uh, yeah, I- I'm still sort of reserving myself uh, to to plunge in the whole way into buying. Uh, gold, but I do own silver, and I've been buying silver since about twenty six dollars, all the way down around twenty two and nineteen. So I believe silver offers great value at the moment. And silver represents a large portion of your funds allocation, from what I understand. What excites you about silver more so than gold or other places that you could allocate the money in your fund at this point? Yes, I mean silver is by and large the largest holding that I have in my fund. Uh, at certain points, you can get up to 85% of overall NAV. So, I, you know, it's like a one-way bet for me, I guess. Uh, the reason I like silver is because it's historically cheap relative to gold um, in numerous ways. First of all, uh, inflation-adjusted anomaly. Silver has never uh, gone higher than the 1980 uh, record highs recorded around $50 per ounce. So there isn't too many assets out there other than, say, silver or sugar, which I also own, uh, that are tremendously lower than something that was posted 30 years ago, even if it was a speculative mania. Uh, And then if we look at the recent bear market, which started in May 2011 for silver and in September 2011 for gold, silver has declined quite a lot relative to gold. And even though it's a more volatile asset, um, you know, the decline in gold, as I just stated previously, has not really gone down as much as I thought it would before we clear all the um, bulls and shake out all the optimists out of the market where we can build a sound base. From the silver's perspective, it's already down 60% from all-time highs. So, you know, as, as soon as you cross that 50% threshold around $26, $25, I already started slowly adding to my positions. Uh, and I have been doing so you know, in, as I stated before in, on my blog, in June 2013 and in February 2014, around $19, and I continue to be a buyer because I think it offers great value historically. You've been interviewed by Jordan Roy Byrne at the Daily Gold several times, and a discussion you two often have is whether the gold stocks will lead the metals out of this bottom. Jordan contends that the bottom for the stocks is behind us and that the metals might still have a bottom ahead of them. Do you agree? Uh, it's very difficult for me to comment on um, what might or might not happen in the future without bringing out my uh, crystal ball because it's a little bit dusty at the moment. But I do have to admit that the recent action in gold miners has been very positive. Um, so much so that we've had some powerful moves in um, ETFs like GDXJ, the, the junior gold mining where we we are seeing huge movements on the upside with huge volume and even gap ups and things like that. So there's quite a lot of excitement. I'm not as excited as some of these uh, investors, but nonetheless, you know, I don't own any 
uh, shares, but I do own precious metals. I'm very optimistic on the long term. But currently, I'm not so sure that uh, gold miners can lead gold out of the bottom if gold has not yet finished correcting. One of the views that I hold, and this is not a prediction, it's just a possibility, is that when gold broke a $1,000 uh, level uh, back in 2008, nine, uh, as we're coming out of the financial crisis, um, I think that that was a major resistance overcome and a major psychological point, which now could be, doesn't have to be, but could be retested on, on the downside to make sure that that is now not a resistance anymore, but a support. And it's, it's a quite an important psychological level. So to me, you know, uh, 30 to 40 percent corrections are quite standard. And even, you know, 50 percent corrections should be normal in the market every so often. Gold's had a huge run up by having 12 annual um, gains in a row, which is quite unusual in my opinion. The last time I've done research, only something like Nikkei, uh, Nikkei 225 has managed to do that, uh, running up to 1990s uh, in Japan. So um, I think the correction is also quite unusual in the sense that it's taking longer than majority of us thought, but it's only to be expected. Uh, yeah, so gold could still surprise on the downside. Will that drag metals down low? Uh, metal Miners down lower, I'm not so sure. So, um, but they are offer great value regardless. And stepping back to a more macro level, let's talk about the general equities. The S and P has been in a bull market for several years now and continues to climb. Do you have any interest in the U.S. stock market at this time? And what correlation do you see between the general equities and the precious metals? Well, to, to answer the second part of the question first, which might be a little bit easier, correlation breaks down. I've posted on my blog a variety of times, uh, uh, I guess, a chart that groups together S&P 500 or the Dow Jones together with the gold mining index. And sometimes they correlate positively, sometimes they correlate negatively, sometimes they don't have correlation at all. They just do their own things. Um, so it really depends. I mean, uh, recently the S&P 500 this month and the gold miners have moved up together with a breakout over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but at the same time, they've been correlated very negatively to, 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 throughout the 2013, as many of you uh, would know if you've been trading the, uh, both sides of the uh, indexes, indices. Um, for me, uh, the reason S&P 500 is performing so strongly at the present time is because it, precisely what gold hasn't done so far is that S&P 500 had a tremendous correction, a huge bear market as we all remember in 2008 leading into 6th of March 2009, bottom at 666 points. So, uh, you know, we, we went down almost 60%. Uh, and that's a huge correction which gold hasn't had in, I think, over 15 years or so. So when you have a correction like that, it really shakes out all the bulls and then it builds a tremendous platform uh, and an opportunity for the prices to rise in, in, in the long term. And that's what S&P is doing. Now, would I be buying stocks right here? Definitely not. I mean, when I look at the sentiment uh, on the current stock market positions, it's extremely bullish. And the market has uh, more than, I think, almost tripled from the lows that we just discussed in 2009. And um, the way I see it, the majority of this bull market has played out. Now, if I was to have certain opinion of the market, it would be more on the short side than the long side. But I haven't uh, considered shorting the stock market just yet. Um, after the recent run-up, I, I definitely think that um, even though the market is, let's, let's call it frothy and overvalued, uh, especially by long-term valuations like uh, cyclically adjusted price-to-earnings ratios, sometimes these things run much longer than we can all foresee. So um, the market could top tomorrow or it can top in three months or it can top in you know, three quarters from now. But uh, I definitely think uh, the situation is getting more dangerous. So I would not be a long-term investor here. What is it going to take for gold and silver to really start accelerating upwards? Is it already baked into the cake with the Federal Reserve's monetary easing? Or do we need to see uh, a rise in inflation occur? What do we need to see happen for gold and silver to start moving upwards? Well, if you have a look at the measurements of inflation that we commonly use on CNBC, Bloomberg, and the way the economists report inflation generally, uh, the consumer price indices, uh, they correlate as a lagging indicator towards commodity prices, the CRB index, the Continuous Commodity Index. So 
commodities actually lead inflation and gold and silver is very good at sniffing and sensing this out much before it happens. So when gold and silver moves up, that's when inflation is going to be seen. So it's already going to be too late to invest once you realize that inflation is there. Unless, of course, prices are still quite low relative to the, where they might be if one believes that gold and silver secular bull market would eventually turn into a bubble mania as it did in 1979. Um, having said that, there's a variety of catalysts that, that can happen, but what interests me the most is the market itself. Uh, the way that I invest is that I, I don't pay attention to the Federal Reserve. Uh, it, my opinion is, and I constantly talk to quite a lot of people uh, that are traders and investors, and I always hold the view and always state this view that Federal Reserve has no idea what they're doing. Um, just recently, I was watching a Bloomberg interview, uh, and uh, there was a great chart that was posted with the Fed funds rate expectations by the Board of Reserve members of Federal Reserve. And in 2009... Every single Federal Reserve member thought that the interest rates were going to be much higher than 1% by 2014. And today, in 2014, uh, we're still at 0%. And every year since 2009, they continue to think that interest rates will eventually go up. And every year, they get it wrong. And the forecast that they do on the economy, they get it wrong. And the forecast that they do on employment, they get it wrong. Um, so the Federal Reserve is a... Uh, is a group of people similar to us investors who sit around and look at the same data that we do, except that they don't have the contrarian aspect, nor are they speculators, nor do they understand the way the markets work. So I wouldn't really pay attention to the Federal Reserve, uh, nor would I pay attention to catalysts out of Europe and so on and so forth. I mean, these fundamentals that are occurring about money printing are always positive for the long-term effect of gold and silver, but the main aspect that I would look at is the price itself. Um, and that's the way that I've been investing from the beginning. Last question for you, Tiho. Talk to our listeners about sugar. Investors have little knowledge of how to speculate on this play, and I currently spend much of my time in Guatemala, which is a large sugar producer. I can tell you that all the warehouses in the port city have gone from being vacant last year to fully capacitated in the past three months. All of the sugar companies have rented warehouses to store sugar, prior to sales in anticipation of higher sugar prices moving forward. Why is this? What will drive sugar prices higher and how do investors play on this moving forward to try and make some money? Yes, I mean, I, I think what you said is perfect signal for me to just go and rush out and buy some more sugar after this interview is finished uh, because I'm a huge believer that um, when the sentiment is very negative and the talk around town is always that there is abundance of sugar everywhere, uh, and we have a glut of, of whether it's one commodity or another, in this case, sugar, uh, that's the best time to be buying. Uh, and that's usually when markets bottom. On the other hand, markets usually peak or top when the optimism is uh, in abundance and there is a fear of deficits and uh, shortages uh, brewing everywhere. So the best time, in my opinion, is to, to be buying sugar now. And the reason for that is if the warehouses are full and inventory is, uh, let's say, high, for the present time, not historically, but just for the present time in a cycle, after we had three years of two to three years of surplus already for the sugar market, the farmers are looking at the price, which has declined over the last three years by more than fifty percent, and they're looking at the current level of sugar prices as not being profitable to continue planting. So what the market does, it's a discount mechanism. It doesn't worry about the current levels of sugar because that's already in the price. Uh, sorry, the current uh, supply of sugar, because that's already in the price. What it worries about is the next season's planting, uh, the amount of that planting that or harvest that will go into production of ethanol relative to the production of, uh, uh, I guess, from raw sugar to white sugar, uh, processed sugar, So, and, and the actual demand that might be coming out of main players such as China. So from my aspect, after three years of surplus, the sugar market is extremely optimistic that the surplus is going to occur again. And the way that I see it, I think we're running ourselves into a dangerous trouble here as um, the farmers are not too optimistic to participate in the sugar uh, har planting and harvest in the next coming years because the prices are so uncompetitive. And until prices rise, we're not really going to be bringing on future demand, uh, future supplies. Uh, the best way to play sugar, well, it's, it's not the easiest commodity to trade like uh, gold and silver, I guess. I personally wouldn't use um, companies that produce uh, sugar or have any type of 
commercial aspect uh, connected to the actual agricultural commodity. I do it through, uh, by uh, using ETFs, futures and options. So I think that's the best way. But obviously, for those investors out there who do not know how agricultural commodities work, who do not understand the difference between backwardation and contango, and that do not understand how volatile some of these agricultural prices can be, whether they move up 150% year-on-year basis or they decline by 50% on the next year. Um, you know, this is not something that they should just plunge in without doing research. Uh, having said that, I, I see the current level of sugar prices around 18, 18 and a half cents at much, much higher levels in the coming years. Um, and the recent highs in, 2000, in February 2011, around 36 cents, uh, in my opinion, will be easily surpassed. I encourage all of our listeners to visit shortsideoflong.com. Tiho provides some great analysis on worldwide markets, and I especially enjoy the views on commodities. Tiho, thanks so much for joining us today, and we hope to get you back here soon. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much.